Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Wiggle Wednesday. Today, we're going to be talking about worm bin basics. But first, uh, Steve has got several things that he wanted to chat with you all about, uh, including the new website that is up. So I'm going to turn it over to him here. Yeah, we'll give uh, we'll give people a couple minutes here to check in. Just uh, if you can, just let us know where you're from. Um, just give you a quick shout out here. There's a cousin there from Vermont. We got Ronette Reisenberg. Where are you from, Rose Ronette? Uh, she's checking in from YouTube. Let's see, there's uh, Patrick. There's Peter from Tampa. Corey from Canada. Um, what's going Grant. on, Grant? You're a regular. Thanks for joining us every week i think so that's uh that's awesome maggie's checking in from colorado uh who else we got awesome well patsy yeah klein. well what's that i said the great patsy klein is patsy uh, klein is, is joining joining us yeah was she country is that a country artist yes that's country yeah yeah roderick chu from new albany that's right next to where i grew up roderick i grew up in sunbury just uh right near you my dad was actually a teacher at new albany for uh for a couple years um th that was before new albany became a rich town like it is now so a little background on new albany almost all of new albany got bought up by les wexner who owns the uh the limited so limited uh you know i i think gap's not limited but let's see limited uh victoria's secret it's all the same company they he basically bought almost all of new albany <laughs> and uh turned it into a, a rural from a rural town to a, a rich place so uh anyway uh tom uh what's going on out in uh, san jose steve's checking in from oregon carol from atlanta yeah, um, anton from south africa and rick from sydney from australia sydney we are we are global we're worldwide awesome gene from uh Asheville. ronette's uh checking in from colorado so anyway thanks everybody um yeah, this is uh, just our regular Wiggle Wednesday. We kind of start every now and then with some uh, uh, with some uh, housekeeping items. And the housekeeping item that I'm interested in telling you about today is uh, the new website. We had a had a website redesign. And I started the the website in 2014, and you know these things are sort of like living, breathing organisms. And after a while, especially when you have the coding skills that I have, which is like next to none, you end up having kind of this bloated Frankenstein of a, of a website over time. And so, uh, had a new, a new site. Uh, it's a little bit more sleek. It loads a lot faster, which is the whole point. So when you come to the site, uh, it, the pages are going to load more quickly and it's organized in a way that's much more easy to kind of work your way around. So, um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, just give you guys a, a sneak peek. And if you are interested um if you're interested i'd love to have you just go check out the website whether it's now or whether it's later um i'm gonna share my share the screen over here i think everybody can see that so it's just a much more easily uh navigable site if you will so if you just hover over these things you can go to things for beginner for large scale you can check out our products I've got things uh, condensed down into uh, more, uh, I guess, uh, fewer categories uh, like vermicomposting, composting, compost tea, which Troy, of course, has been writing a lot about. Some business issues with uh, and larger scale, uh, some interviews that I did. Most of these I did years ago, um, but it's, it's still relevant today. And then soil biology. And again, Troy is, Troy is writing uh, a lot about soil biology. Uh, the blog is The blog is great. I think it looks, whoops. Uh, I think it looks uh, a lot better uh, than it did. Um, one of the things that we just published is a new post on uh, worm bin pests and problems. So we call it the big book of worm bin pests and problems. It is a really long, uh, I don't want to say long in a bad way. It's just a very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive post on just about anything that could go wrong in a worm bin, whether it's pot worms or mites or ants or, black soldier fly. Some of the things are a little harder for us to diagnose, not diagnose, but tell you how to fix. Um, but we can at least tell you what's going on in your bin and give you some ways to identify what is happening and probably, and probably why. So um, one of the cool things about the site, and this is just more technical, is that if you see a topic over here on the right-hand side and you say, oh, I want to learn about, uh, about mites, 
you can just click that and it's going to take you down to where you, you need to be. So anyway, I'm excited about it. I think it's going to help us a lot. It's going to help you a lot uh, as we can feed you, uh, feed you the information that, that hopefully you need. So I will stop screen share. You can see uh, uh, me and Troy's pretty face again. And um, let's see, stop there. Okay, cool. Um, couple other uh, couple other things is um, Troy. So one of the things that would you, when you do when you uh, get ready to publish a you know a new put out a new website is you stop creating content on the old one. So we actually had some some uh, uh, posts that were built up over time. And we're starting to publish those now. The first one was that big book of worm bin pests and problems. And then the second one, which Troy had the biggest hand in plan, was the introduction to the soil food web. So as most of you know, Troy is not just a worm guy, he's a soil guy. And so uh, we're going to be um, publishing a post on that that will kind of get you up to speed on what the soil food web is and what all the players, they call them characters, uh, are uh, in your soil. So... The last thing I have is that I'm going to handle a few questions that were emailed to me this week. I think that this is a good platform to do that where uh, if if I will typically take multiple questions in a week that I just reply via email to one person, but these might be questions that everybody has. So um, I'll be covering those at the end, but before we get to your questions. But as we go along, of course, let us know where you're from uh, and then... Um, also post some questions that you have, whether it has to do anything with, with what we're talking about today or anything to do with vermicomposting or even soil. So um, cool. With that, I will turn it back over to Troy and we'll get started on, uh, on the presentation. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to turn off the banner. Uh, I guess maybe that's not what that one isn't in the way, but that one's probably fine. Yep. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen here and we'll discuss worm bin basics. Give me a second here. Cool. All right. So yeah, today uh, it's aimed at a bit more beginner level, um, not necessarily setting up a bin, but once you've got your bin going, you know, just some general things to adhere to and um, try and maintain and look out for. So uh, once you've started it up, how do you keep your worms healthy and happy? And today we're going to go through the main needs for a worm bin. Uh, what all should go in there, uh, possibly what shouldn't go in there. And then we'll discuss uh, browns versus greens or, you know, composting. This is all related to composting. So we can kind of go over the difference between those. And then adding foods and bedding to your bin, maintaining proper moisture levels, diagnosing any issues. And then we can go through a uh, question and answer at the end there. So worm bin needs, dang it, sorry, excuse me. Um, just remember that anytime you're gonna put organic matter into a pile that, or even just not even into a pile that uh, in nature decomposition happens naturally, like that's what things are meant to do is just to eventually break down and turn to soil. Um, and in our worm bin, we need to ask the question, you know, how can we assist that? So how can we help the decomposition um, worms are going to be uh, helping in this process of breaking things down. So it's a matter of keeping the environment happy and healthy so that we're keeping microbes and worms happy and healthy. So vermicompost is a style of composting, like I had mentioned. And so we need to follow similar rules as composting. Um, when we're putting things together, we need to make sure that we're mixing browns and greens. And we're going to go into the detail of that in a couple slides here. Um, Always remember that moisture and air is essential. So microbes, especially bacteria and fungi, they're gonna be the first decomposers. We'll go through a slide that discusses that too. So bacteria and fungi don't have mouths and they need things to be moist uh, for them to survive and to be able to uh, function and eat away at things. So they release ac acids and enzymes um, onto material that's gonna break it down that they can then absorb those nutrients and the material organic matter. So they need moisture for that process. And moisture is also essential to our worms and that they need to stay moist so that they can breathe. They breathe through their skin and they need a moist environment for that to be able to happen. And they can, if you let things dry up, it's gonna be detrimental to your worms. 
Um, and always remember that microbes in the bin are going to be doing the majority of the de decomposition. Worms are just aiding in the decomposition of that. So worms are going to be chewing through organic matter and increasing the surface area for bacteria and fungi to come in and break those down further. Um, so with that in mind, if you've got a worm bin, your worm bin isn't touching the soil and you want to have these soil microbes in your worm bin. So it's good to get some soil inoculant or existing vermicompost. So if you've had a vermicompost bin and you're starting a new one, you can take a few handfuls from your old vermicompost and add that to introduce and inoculate these micro good microorganisms into your bin or go out into your yard in a place where there's not been any chemicals sprayed and dig up some nice looking soil or go to a nearby woods or forest um, and take a little bit of a few, just a few handfuls of soil there. And it's good to look for some mycelium, uh, little white threads that are on leaves too. Then you're introducing good fungi into your bin. Uh, and we'll be discussing that in a couple slides here too. And then in your bin, uh, when we're talking about these browns and greens, you want to add a ratio of two to one. So two browns to one green. Um, and what I normally do is I'll keep a little bucket in my kitchen or some people have those little uh, bins with a lid or something like that, that they'll keep in their kitchen. And I'll generally put um, food waste in there and then I'll mix in some shredded newspaper. So I've got a one to one ratio there just to kind of keep that stuff covered. And then when I'm putting that into my worm bin, I'll add a little bit more brown so that it's more of a two to one ratio. Um, that works out well for me and I'm not getting too much brown stuff in there in the beginning. Yeah, those uh, those countertop things that call themselves compost bins, they're really not, It's you're really not composting there. It's just, I call it a stylish way for your food to rot. So um, don't, I, I think most people that are watching this probably already know that, but don't be fooled by these uh, nice stainless steel coffee can looking things that just are supposed to sit on your, uh, you know, sit on your, your counter. That's just a, uh, yeah. It's, it's not composting at that point. <laughs> yeah, it's a miniature transfer station. So it right. would be the same thing as trucks that come and pick up compost materials and haul them to a compost site. That's basically a mini truck that's going to hold that stuff until you're getting it to a place where you're going to compost it. Moving on. Uh, so I wanted to add this slide in here. Uh, I just mentioned how important moisture is to all these microorganisms. So this is a photo from, uh, I took it from America's Test Kitchen that I follow on social media. Uh, so they're trying to kind of show the opposite of what we're trying to do there. And it may be a bit confusing because people say that you want your compost at the same moisture level as a wrung out sponge, but they're looking at uh, a sponge that you wring out and then allow to dry like on your counter. So it's saying, you know, if you, if you wring out your sponge and allow it to dry, you've only got 20 colony forming units per milliliter. So barely any bacteria in there. Whereas if you leave that sponge wet, you've got 25,000 more times the amount of bacteria and other organisms in there. You've got 500,000 colony forming units per milliliter. So we're wanting to uh, really have thriving populations of bacteria, fungi, all these other microorganisms. So we want things to be moist. And this is a, just a good representation of how moisture is going to help to keep those uh, microorganism populations thriving. So we always want to make sure that we've got moisture in there and don't let things dry up completely. And I'm going to be discussing that more too. Uh, I just wanted to touch on this. So when we're talking about composting or vermicomposting, um, really it's when you're wanting things to break down like that, you got to think like a microbe. So the first, uh, I've got my, I'm going to use my pointer here. We've got organic matter. Um, so you're putting this organic matter from food scraps, uh, newspaper, cardboard, wood chips, leaves, whatever you've got in your worm bin there that's going to provide organic matter, which is going to be food for the uh, what here is called the second trophic level or it's what's going to be the decomposers. So bacteria and fungi are the main decomposers of organic matter in the soil or out of the soil. Like if you leave food out on your counter and just let it sit there like a loaf of bread. You've got bacteria and fungi that are already on the surfaces of there and inside, but you've got more that are going to move on to the surface and mold's going to start to um, form and break this material down. So 
we're wanting to do that in our worm bin. So we have bacteria and fungi, which are going to be on the surfaces of these things and uh, breaking down that organic matter. And from there, we move up in trophic levels to their predators, which are going to eat and consume bacteria and fungi. So uh, amoeba, flagellates, ciliates, nematodes, uh, arthropods. So worms are going to be up in the food chain from that. And we've got worms gaining their nutrition from these protozoa, fungi, and other smaller beings. So if you want a healthy worm population, you need to feed the worms well, which is going to be having healthy populations of protozoa. And in order to have healthy populations of protozoa, we need to have healthy populations of bacteria and fungi. So it all starts with these lower trophic levels and lower organisms. Um, that's just super important to always remember that we're working with microorganisms and to keep them happy, to keep the worms happy. I need to take a quick drink of water here. So what is the difference between browns and greens when we talk about browns and greens in a, car, uh, in a compost pile? Browns are going to be carbonaceous material, things that are take longer to break down, things with more lignin and cellulose, and that it's going to take uh, more fungi to come in and break those particles down. So we're talking about leaves, wood chips, sticks, stalks. Uh, shredded corrugated cardboard or regular cardboard or paper like newspapers or junk mail. Um, you just want to make sure that you're not using anything paper or cardboard that has glossy sides to it because that those can um, uh, add some toxins into our compost. So you've got the brown material that would be considered bedding. Uh, also in there we would have you know cocoa core or peat moss. I apologize I didn't get those on the list. Uh, those are things that people, a lot of people use for the brown material because that's a nice bedding for worms. Um, and then for greens, we've got nitro nitrogenous material and nitrogen rich material. So that's going to be our food scraps, coffee grounds, grass, weeds, uh, any fresh green plant matter. So, you know, if you're trimming things up in your garden, cutting some leaves off or pulling uh, small branches off, those are going to be considered green matter. Um, if anything turns more stocky on your plant, then that's going to be considered more brown matter. Or um, uh, one thing is hay and straw. So hay and straw can come from the same type of grass. Hay is when you cut it green, and so it would be considered green material. Straw can be that same plant, but you are allowing the plant to die and the, uh, uh, I swear I'm hearing someone in my lower level and nobody's supposed to be in the house. So I apologize, I'm <laughs> looking down. Uh, if, Troy, if, Troy, if you die here soon, we'll, uh, you know. Just, <laughs> I get sucked I'll take over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so yeah. Can I, can I stop you there before you get murdered? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Um, I kind of hate talking about things in terms of greens and browns because, you know, we think of browns as the carbon rich material and greens as a nitrogen rich material. But when you look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio of any of these things, they are still more carbon than they are nitrogen. So yes. something that is considered the most green of green material, which would be chicken manure that has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of six to one. That means there is six times more nitrogen, mass of nitrogen, I'm sorry, mass of carbon then there is nitrogen. So all of these things have more carbon than they do nitrogen. So when you say, I'm going to add some browns and greens, you can't think of every brown as being the same. And you can't think of every green as being the same, which is why it's good to have like a compost calculator or something like that. We've got one on our site um, as well. Uh, if you just Google urban worm compost calculator, you'll, you'll stumble, you'll stumble on it and it will provide you with a good carbon to nitrogen ratio that you're looking for. So it's a good shorthand to talk about browns and greens or carbon and nitrogen, but understand that, that there's, it's very variable within each brown and green, and you're still always going to end up with far more carbon than you do nitrogen. So, and let me just go, I'll lead into to this here uh, since I, it's, it's a little bit of my, I'll take credit for this one, Troy, with the, uh, what I call the freak out test is that 
the one way of telling if something is a brown or a green is is how concerned you'd be if you were on vacation somewhere there's no way of getting home and somebody calls and says did you know you left a pile of something on your kitchen floor if it was a pile of food waste you'd be freaking out because that is a green if you're not freaking out about it they go oh it's a, it's a pile of paper or it's uh you know it's cardboard or it's peat moss you'd be like well that's kind of weird but you wouldn't freak out about it you wouldn't worry about what you'd get you know, what you'd come home to. So if you'd be worried about it, it's a green. If you're not worried about it, it's a, it's a brown. All right. I'll uh, hand it back to you, Troy. Glad yeah. You thank you for adding that. That was a good point about um, if someone were to look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio, that's absolutely right. So yeah, most things that are like 30, uh, 30 to one carbon <laughs> to nitrogen ratio are going to be green material. So your food scraps generally are going to be anywhere between 10 to 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, whereas the brown material is going to be hundreds to thousands to one of carbon to nitrogen ratio. So much, much higher in carbon. Rick, Rick from uh, Sydney just said, you know, sawdust is 500 to one. And, and so like hard old, like I believe it's hard wood chips would be something that high. Whereas you might have something like um, straw, which is going to be uh, much less, a much lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. So yeah. huge variability in the browns. There's not as much variability in the greens. I, and actually, uh, sawdust, I've seen most books are like, it's more like 5,000 to one. So I don't even like to use sawdust because you would think it with such small particle size, it would break down easily, but it's it makes it so much more higher carbon to nitrogen ratio that it's not going to really break down. Hmm. Um and so yeah, the, like a lesson with that is so cedar cedar wood is extremely high in uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio, and that's why it makes such a good like for shingles and things like that because it doesn't break down easily due to that extremely high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So yeah, in, things interesting are interesting thing about cedar, it also has some antimicrobial um, uh, characteristics to it. So when people say, "Can I put cedar wood chips in my bin?" I'm like, I probably choose any other wood chip than cedar. Like cedar is out there because it does not decompose. That's a great yeah. outdoor outdoor material. So I would I would stay away from from cedar. Not every cedar is the same, but I would just stay away from cedar altogether. Yeah, exactly. If you happen to have some cedar chips moved mixed in with like a whole bunch of other chips, it's not necessarily like they're it's a contaminated thing. But yeah, you wouldn't want to use just cedar in something. Uh, so. Next slide is adding foods and bedding to the bin. Um, with this, you just want to really make sure that you're balancing it all out. And like we said, a, a good rule of thumb is a two to one ratio of two browns to one green. So whenever you're adding foods, it's good to bury them or cover them. So if you've got your worm bin going and this is the level of the top of the bed here, if you bury that down, you've got definitely got some uh, microbial action in in all of this, but especially in these first few inches here. So once you bury it in there, uh, you're uh, putting it down and covering it with stuff that you're increasing the uh, potential for microbes to be moving onto that immediately and breaking that down. And by burying it into the way stuff you have already, or by taking brown stuff and covering it immediately, you're lessening the potential for pests. So flies will come on to moist food waste uh, and lay their eggs or, you know, hang out, but on moist cardboard or something like that, it's really not likely that you're going to have pest things that are coming in and landing on, you know, wet bedding, cardboard, cocoa core, or anything like that. Uh, and then when you're adding foods, you want to limit the amount that you're adding each time. So, when you go out to add food, do you want to add, you know, just maybe an inch of food to the inch of layer or uh, for people in other parts of the world, two and a half centimeters uh, of food, scraps, waste, car composted, whatever you're put adding as a food source. Um, just keep it to like an inch. And then you want to allow the worms to work through that entire amount before you're adding more food. So, uh, you know, some people are like, oh, I can add according to the amount of worms that I have, I have a pound of worms. So every day they should be chewing through a third of a pound of food waste. So, you know, I calculate that every this many days I can add food. Well, 
it doesn't work. Nature doesn't work like that. You have to make sure that you're waiting until that food has been broken down or worked through by the worms, I should say, until you're adding more. Because if you just keep adding more food without them fully breaking it down, um, you're likely to possibly get anaerobic conditions or start to see some pest issues, possibly um, lowering the pH and having some fermentation and things. So we're going to talk about that in a second as well. Uh, always add brown bedding when you're adding food, unless there is a surplus of brown material. So if you happen to have, you know, shredded a bunch of cardboard and dumped that in there and you've got excess that um, is not, doesn't have buried food scraps in there, then you could, you know, just add food. But otherwise, anytime you're adding green, just, you know, green nitrogen rich material, you want to make sure that you're adding at least that same amount of browns, if not twice as much brown stuff. Um, and then uh, I know that people hear stories about citrus and onions and adding or not adding those to bins. Um, people like to put out, people like to scare other people with different things. Um, there was a great, I can't remember, I don't think it was on there. I'm not sure if it was on the urban worm site or on another vermiculture vermicompost uh, Facebook group, but somebody had done a time lapse of putting four uh, lemon halves right on top of their worm bin and uh, did the time lapse. And you can see like within a day there are worms moving in. So I think it's the citronella is the acid uh, that's on citrus that is harmful to the skin of worms. But as soon as you add that to the bin, it's going to, um, dissolve, you know, rather soon by micro microbial action. So then the worms can come in and they're not going to have, it's not going to be detrimental to them, you know, and with onions too, um, it's not like someone's probably going to be adding, you know, nothing but onions to their bed. So if you're chopping up some onions to make a soup or something like that and throwing them in your bin, it's really not going to be that big of a deal. Uh, freezing food. A lot of people talk about freezing food, uh, either because they don't have the space to compost it. So they'll throw it in the freezer before they add it to the worm bin, or people like to do it because the water expands and ruptures the cell of the food and then starts to kind of break it down already. So that's totally fine to do. Um, there's no issue with freezing food like that. Uh, you just want to make sure again, to add when you're putting that in your bin, you want to make sure that you're adding brown material. Um, and then I've seen different people who make a slurry of food. So basically kind of making a smoothie of their um, food waste and then pouring that on top of the bin. It's not always going to be a problem, but it, it has been an issue when people have tried that in the past where it like creates this layer on top that there's no airflow in between them and the worms just aren't able to really come up and, and they're not wanting to because there's not air at the top. So that, it can be con it cause issues. So you'd want to limit if you're making a slurry, just kind of limit it or make sure that you're spreading it or only putting in little like piles or something so that you've got airflow in there as well. Yeah. The slurry, the slurry is like this, this is kind of the analogy I use that if, if I asked you to drink five gallons of water, well, you're like, okay, sure. I'll do that here. And I can, that'll take me a day or two. Right. Um, but if I said, I need you to drink five gallons of water here in the next five minutes, that'd be a different story. And so that's what you're doing when you do a, make a slurry of food waste. And by slurry, it's just, you're basically, if you're blending food waste all together, you're going to end up with something that's very liquidy because that, you know, the food waste is 85% water. Like if you took an apple, an apple is not going to feel wet in your hands, but it's 85% water. So if you took it and put it into a food processor, a, you know, Vitamix or a Ninja, one of those things is just going to literally turn it into a soup. It didn't add any water. It just released all the water that was bound up in the cell walls. So you're, you're saying here, worm bin, take all of this food and all of the released moisture at one time, and it's going to just drain to the bottom. That's why I don't really like slurries unless you're going to add a crap load of browns with it to, to absorb all that moisture. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I appreciate that. Uh, cool. And then the last thing is to make sure that you're watching out for salty products, especially. Uh, so when you purchase cocoa core, a lot of the times it will say, you know, salt removed, or uh, I don't remember exactly the wording that they use. Um, but if you th believe that you have cocoa core that might be, um, have some salt still, you can soak it and, uh, drain the water away 
and then um, possibly do that one more time. And then watch out for peanut shells. So uh, I always remember uh, I had been staying with these girls when I started, when I was apprenticing at Rodale or before I started working at Rodale. And one of the girls had eaten a bunch of peanuts and put all the shells thinking, oh, well, that would be, you know, great food for the worms. But they, it was, you know, coated in salt. And so salt is going to rob the worms or bedding of its moisture as it soaks it up. And the next morning she came down and had worms crawling up the walls and on the ceiling and everything else. So um, that's one thing that you got to watch out for. I was trying to think of any other foods that uh, potentially would be dangerous, but um, I wasn't, nothing was coming to mind there. So uh, moving on here. So we've got food. Um, the other thing we need to make sure is that we're keeping moisture in the bin. Generally, if you're using food scraps, it's not going to be too much of an issue to maintain moisture. Uh, if you're in a hot area like a desert or something like that where you've got a lot of heat and not much moisture, you could be losing moisture from your bin. So you'd want to make sure that you're uh, monitoring that all the time. Uh, and wherever you live, it's good to monitor your moisture levels. So um, when you're adding water, misting is going to be the best because we're really wanting to keep mainly that top four or six inches wet. And so if you can use some type of mister to mist that top daily or every other day, uh, that's going to be best. So small but frequent additions of water. So if, if you think about, you know, you've got chunky stuff in your worm bin and you're taking either, you know, a glass of water and pouring that on top or even a, um, like a flower watering can that makes, you know, a shower of water, if you're putting that much in there, it's likely that it's going to be hitting and not soaking up as much because you've got bigger drops of water. And so it's going to move down into the bin where you've already probably got enough moisture and you don't need more moisture. So it's good to mist so that it can allow that stuff on the top to kind of soak it up. So um, I wanted to talk about hydrophobic things. So a sponge is meant to soak up water but if you've got a sponge that you've left set out and it's completely dry it's hydrophobic to begin with if you put water on there it just repels the water and beads off generally and maybe soaks up a tiny bit so that sponge is hydrophobic at first until you get a bit of moisture in there and then it starts to soak up the water so in that same fashion we can think about our worm bin like a sponge if things are really drying up in there and you've got dry cardboard or dry paper, it's likely going to be repelling water if you're adding it in there. So we need to keep things moist. Uh, and so that's why the frequent addition of moisture and small amounts in, in misting is going to be the best for not allowing these things to go hydrophobic at all and to, to maintain a good moisture level where it's not um, moving down through the layers to the bottom of the bin. So soaking dry materials will be good. Like if you have, um, especially when you're starting a bin, you know, if you have newspaper, you would want to soak that in some water uh, to allow the water to penetrate it. Unless you're uh, adding a lot of food scraps, which, you know, Steve had just mentioned, they're generally 85 to 90% water uh, in any food scraps. So if you're adding a bunch of wet stuff, you can put it in with some dry material and allow that moisture to be soaked up by uh, that dry bedding. But otherwise, um, if there's any concern, it's good to soak that stuff first so that it's not hydrophobic, like I said. And cardboard especially can be hydrophobic. You know, if, if you're ripping it up and leaving it into, you know, bigger chunks like that, especially there's not as much surface area for that water to soak in. Um, so, in that same sense, it's good with cardboard to shred it up, put it through some type of shredder where you're uh, really got smaller particle size, more surface area to soak up water. So if you're going to buy a, if you're going to buy a shredder, I would also recommend a cross cut shredder where it goes down. It doesn't create just strips; it creates strips and then and then cuts it sideways. So the squares they tend to be a little bit more expensive, but I, I think you know you can find decent ones online for. 60 bucks that that like an eight i the one i have right here is actually i think an eight or a 12 page shredder but it's good for normal like amazon boxes and stuff it'll just make these nice little squares 
Uh, so if you can get a crosscut shredder, I would, I would, I would do that. Good. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that's something we can cover in the future too, uh, is things like that, that are going to aid in, uh, maintaining the bin. Uh, but yeah, so cardboard, uh, especially is good soaked in water generally, but again, if you're using it to add to really wet foods or say you've got a bin that for some reason has excess moisture in there and you need to soak up some uh, moisture uh, cardboard like Steve was just talking about that's gone through a cross cut shredder that has these very small particle sizes are gonna really work to soak up that water well. So that's one, um, one area where you wouldn't necessarily wanna soak the cardboard first. And then a lot of people are can become concerned or, or uh, get concerned about maintaining pH. I generally don't worry about it too much. If you're keeping a good uh, brown to green ratio and keeping some fluff in there, porosity where it's breathing, got good moisture, but also good airflow, um, you really don't have to worry about pH too much. But if you're new and, it, and you've, it's, it's a concern for you, you can test for it. Um, they have those little strips that you can, you know, like they use for pools that you collect the water and dip the little strip. Uh, those can become cost, not as cost of effective as like buying a pH uh, monitor, which has a little probe on it that you can stick into your bin and just easily monitor the pH. So, um, yeah, if you're wanting to monitor, I would suggest getting one of those probes. Uh, the main concern with pH generally is the pH dropping and going acidic. And that's usually caused, like I said, by adding, continuing to add foods without allowing the stuff that's in there to be worked over by worms and microorganisms. So that stuff starts to ferment. Um, it can cause issues with your worm where they get sauerkraut or you're going to have anaerobic conditions where you're breeding anaerobic microorganisms um, that aren't necessarily going to be healthy for you or your plants when you're using them. Um, so if you did run into an issue where you start to go acidic, um, my first go-to thing would be to kind of stir up all of that material and add some brown stuff to try to soak up the water uh, and make it aerobic and hopefully bring that pH up. But if you if that doesn't seem to work or it's extremely acidic, you can add some agricultural lime and it takes very small amounts, just tiny minute amounts of agricultural lime to raise the pH to a neutral level. Or uh, pulverized eggshells also are gonna be good. So anything that's high in calcium is gonna help um, to raise that pH up, but you don't want to get it too high also. Um, so generally, to, um, if you're starting to go up into the higher uh, numbers on the pH, it could be because of the bacteria that are um, in the bin. So you've got so much bacteria, they when they release uh, their enzymes and things that they're using to eat away at foods, that is a more alkaline substance. So if you've got a whole lot of bacterial action in your bin, that can uh, raise the pH a little bit too. So if you're seeing higher levels, but generally worms want to be right in that middle, like six to eight, they can even take a bit of a acidic um, environment. So, you know, even down to four or five. So yeah, uh, otherwise, Really, I honestly have never taken a pH reading on my worm bin, not not once in the years. Neither have I. <laughs> that, that's one of those things I think people are really worried about it, especially in the beginning. They want to micromanage all of the different things. And if you are sort of, at, if you're adding plenty of bedding with your food waste, this just isn't an issue. I just don't have this problem. So, um, you know, I, 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 I have tested it, but it's like I've tested it only to verify that I don't have a problem, not because I thought I had a problem and I, and I really haven't. It's been slightly acidic the whole time. Yeah. So cool. I'm glad that you use that term micromanaging. So I was going to kind of mention that when I was talking about diagnosing issues here, it, I see it by the 
posts that I see in worm groups of beginning worm composters, a lot of people want to micromanage and they'll get in there every day and be like, oh my gosh, my worm's three inches away from where it was yesterday. What am I going to do? Or it's just like the, the smallest things I see. And in, in really when you're dealing with a worm bin, the best thing is to do your thing to add foods and then leave it alone. You know, you can make observations and it's fun to look at them and watch them and see what they do, but they really just want to be left alone. So if you can just do your thing and leave them alone, you're going to be happier. Your worms are going to be happier. Um, yeah. So try, try not to be a helicopter parent with your worms. <laughs> uh, so diagnosing any issues that you might see, I wanted to, I, I was trying to kind of scour through some of the Facebook groups for just different things that people become concerned about that um, either are actually a concern or aren't really a concern. So these are some of the things that popped up um, that I could think of or, or came across. So um, people, I've seen several people lately, I don't mean to roll my eyes, um, who like notice the worms crawling on the walls or the top of their bin and think that there's an issue simply because they're out of the organic matter. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like worms just to like to some worms, as long as, you know, it, it's like, you know, not very many that you're getting that are um, outside of the material. They just like to go somewhere else and explore. Uh, or there's, um, I believe it's the Indian blues that when there's like rain or, or a change in the um, barometric pressure, they'll start to crawl more. Um, and it's not necessarily an issue of things in your bin. It's just the barometric pressure. So as long as the majority of your worms aren't trying to have some max mass exodus where they're crawling out the sides or anything like that, there's absolutely nothing to worry about. Yeah, the worms worms love moisture, and they're just going to go hang out in the condensation because the condensation is going to be full of microbes too. So they're going to be happy in that environment. They're just going to hang out where it's where it's wet. And if you've got condensation on the walls of your bin or on the lid, they'll hang out there happily. Yep. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, same in what I just was referring to and, and Steve was just talking about. There's like you might see balls of worms, which was referred to as a clue um, where they're just all huddled up in a mass. And um, I I've read a lot of things about worms and I've never read exactly why they do this. But like I've noticed in my bin, um, it generally happens where there's a healthy amount of moisture, but also airflow. So like where I've penetrated the outside of the bin with some holes to let them breathe, like as my material moves up and it's, if it's kind of close to that air pocket where the air comes in, they'll really be hanging out there because it's, it's, there's a happy environment. They've got a lot of microbial action there that they can um, eat and it, it's just a good place for them to be. So nothing to worry about when you see them balled up like that. Um, one of the things that can be an issue, so if you're having worms staying near the bottom of your bin, especially like a urban worm bag, that's a, you know, you've got several feet to flow through. That's normally because you have a good amount of moisture on the bottom there that they are liking that moist environment and it's possibly dried out, you know, the upper half's dried out a little bit or, uh, something's going on up there where they're just preferring the bottom and, and it's usually, it's generally 90% of the time I probably, when I get questions about it, it's because there's too much moisture on the, not necessarily too much moisture, but a, a healthy amount of moisture in the bottom of the bin and not as much in the top. So they're wanting to be down in that moisture there. Um, and yeah, the other, one of the main issues that people are going to come across is having a bin that's oversaturated with water. And that's generally because they're adding nothing but people are adding nothing but green fresh food scraps or something like that to their bin without balancing it out with some brown bedding uh, or uh, or they're um, adding frequent amounts of water but too much water frequently um, you really just want to limit it to you know if you had an urban worm bag I mean you'd probably only need if if you if you were in a hot area where you're losing moisture you know just a couple cups of water a day, maybe um, not more than that, I would say, especially if it's staying moist. So uh, other issues to diagnose 
any compost, you want to look out for foul smells. So if there's some type of odor that you find noxious to you, it's definitely going to be an issue for the microorganisms that you're trying to grow. So anytime you're smelling something foul, you want to immediately get air incorporated into there. So either if it's extremely, it's likely because it's due to it's too moist and you're going anaerobic. So you would want to stir up that material or if it's uh, super wet, you may need to, you know, kind of dump it out and add some brown material to soak that up and then put it back into your bin. Uh, but really it's about getting air into that material usually when you have a foul smell. Um, you, the other thing to look out for is odd shaped worms. So we had our, um, a few weeks back, we went through uh, sour crop in worms. Um, the other word for it is escaping me all of a sudden. What is it, Steve? Protein poisoning. Protein poisoning, yeah. Or col gonna... or col we called it colon blow for worms. Colon blow, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you have worms that are getting like, uh, what's also called string of pearls. They'll look like they have these balls. It's definitely not normal in a worm. You can definitely tell that there's something going on with your worms when this is happening. So uh, if you've got odd shaped worms or worms that look like a you know pearl necklace or, um, or your worms start to die or something like that, it's likely due to anaerobic conditions and fermentation within your worm bin where, um, that food is going acidic and starting to ferment. Um, the other thing that I see on a lot of chats is uh, people who find worms other than the ones they started with, especially people are freaking out about these jumping worms. They'll find a worm in their bin and think that if you find a worm other than if you've got say red wigglers um, and you find another worm that you're concerned about just, just take it out and put it outside, you know, like don't, don't fret over it. Uh, if you think that it is one of the wor jumping worms, you will know that it's one of the jumping worms because if they're exposed to air, they really don't stop jumping. They're going to basically be squirming and wriggling all the time. Um, but I wanted to note that even red wigglers will jump. So if you have a red wiggler that's on your hand and it falls onto the bin, it might get a little freaked out and kind of jump at first or, you know, wriggle a little bit, but then, immediately normally they're calming down and and moving into the environment or something like that where these jumping worms that are invasive are are going to be bigger than a, most of the composting worms that we're using but they're like worms that just freak out they just they non-stop are uh, moving their bodies to like a it's basically like a bull in a in a rodeo um yeah, and then if you uh, run into, if you have any other concerns in the bin or you run into what you would consider pests or things that you may be concerned, other organisms that you may be concerned about, um, Steve had mentioned that at the beginning of our talk today that we just released a big book of worm bin pests and problems. Uh, and I tried to be, I tried to cover anything that you would uh, come across in a worm bin. There may be a few things that, are in the list, but it should be pretty comprehensive. Uh, and the main thing to remember when you have a worm bin is that it's not a monoculture of worms. So uh, yes, you've got your composting worms in there, but it's gonna be an ecosystem of all kinds of things. So you're gonna likely have springtails or isopods or maybe a little bit of mold. All these things are gonna help to break down particle sizes, decompose this stuff and make it into vermicompost and the end product that you want. So most of all of these things that you're going to be seeing there are going to be helpers, just like our worms are going to be helpers to help bacteria and fungi to break down organic matter and turn it into compost. So um, yes, it's completely good and fine to be seeing other types of organisms that are in your bin other than just your worms. Uh, and with that, uh, we can start taking questions. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Let's see our big faces again. Um, okay. So I'm going to start with three questions. We are we already have like 18 other ones in the queue. So I'm just going to try to rapid fire these, Troy. So um, I will hand a couple over to you. Just go ahead and give the, you know, 30 second, 10 cent answer. And, and, and we'll, uh, if we need to follow up with that later, we can. So um, this week I had uh, 
had some had some questions emailed to me. And like I said, I think that this is a good platform for us to answer some of those questions. Of course, if you if you send us an email, we're going to answer your period. But it's also good to kind of share these with with the group. Somebody asked about whether you should fluff a bin. You know, they call it fluffing, where you just sort of grab the the top few inches and just just sort of aerate uh, aerate the bin. And if I thought that was a good idea, or if he should do it, and I tend not to be prescriptive with with too much stuff. I'm kind of like, I don't really think that a properly maintained worm bin needs to be fluffed, as it were. Uh, it should stay plenty aerobic. I think our idea of what we think is aerobic and like very airy is going to be different than a worm. A worm's going to get the the oxygen it needs under vermicompost as long as that vermicompost is staying aerobic and has enough of those little tiny little pore spaces where that air can get back in there. Now, if you think that your bin is going anaerobic, then it probably is a good idea to not just fluff your bin, but fluff it and then add bedding there to kind of add that bulk and add that that aerobic capacity. So I'm kind of like, eh, on, on fluffing a bin. Um, somebody is using rainwater and draining it right into their bin, which sort of on the surface seems like a good way of using rainwater, but you're, you're going to, when you when you have an unmetered way of adding water to a worm bin, let's say you're flushing your worm bin, you're going to create anaerobic pockets because that, that water goes down, it occupies that pore space that used to be uh, occupied by air. Now it's occupied by liquid. The microbes consume the available oxygen in that liquid, and now you're left with an anaerobic mess. So that's the issue you have with, with uh, really wet composts is that they are going to go anaerobic on you. So I, I'm it sounds like a great way to recycle water, but unless you're somehow able to meter how much water your worm bin gets each day, I, I don't think that I would, uh, don't think that I would do it. Somebody also asked if I had a good recommendation for a hygrometer, which is really a way to measure moisture in soil. I really don't. Anything that I would suggest to the home worm bin owner um, is going to tend to be cheap and it's going to tend to get corroded over time, which is going to foul up the probes that are going to be measuring the moisture. So, um, <clears throat> you can find these probes that I think, I think golf courses will use ones that are like really short and they'll just stick them right in the, the top. Uh, there are other ones that are like about maybe five inches long, six inches long that you put in. And there's often two, uh, two, two probes. Those tend to get corroded. The other thing is, is when you've got those probes, it's, it's measuring the average along the entire probe. So if you, if you, if your worm bin is say six inches deep, now most are going to be a little bit uh, deeper than that, but let's say six inches deep, you got an eight inch probe. There's two inches of it that are going to be exposed to the air. And it's, if it's a cheap probe, it's just going to get corroded over time. So I tend not to tell people to even get it at all. What you want to do is just grab a handful of it and squeeze it as hard as you can. If you get one drop out, that's about 70%. That's probably about the max moisture that I would like to see as you start to get closer to wanting to harvest. You want to dry that out a little bit. So you want it to, you want it not to get that water, but still main, maintain its ability to stick to itself. So um, Troy, I don't know if you have anything to add on on that one there, but I, I just I tell people don't worry about these buying a tool to measure water in your bin. Let your hands let your hands figure it out. Yeah, I was going to add that to to the last question and to this one. Um, I had neglected to say when you are adding water to your bin, um, you never, I, I shouldn't say never, you really don't want to see water coming out the bottom of your bin. You don't want to have enough excess water that you have water draining out of your bin and have leachate. So if you're adding water, um, if you have water that's coming out of the bottom of your bin, then you're definitely adding too much. And that stuff that's coming out of the bottom is considered leachate. It's not uh, worm tea. Uh, that's a whole nother talk, but uh, <laughs> just remember that that's a leachate. And then, yeah, uh, I use the hand squeeze moisture test. So I usually tell people it's 50%, but uh, yeah, one or two drops out of the bottom of your hand or water coming out between your fingers. If you're squeezing a handful real nice, um, that's about 50% water. Um, there's a whole, normally with worm bins, you're, you're on the too moist side. Uh, dealing with other compost, you can be on the too dry side. So there's good ways of telling other um, other levels drier than that. But that's a good a hand squeeze moisture test is good. 
Okay. Uh, Alvin on YouTube, is he, he's got a couple good questions for us. Is adding some good compost to your initial bedding a good idea in a new worm bin? And yes, <laughs> you are trying to inoculate your bin with microbes. And if you've got compost, assuming it's microbially active compost, it's a great idea to add it. I think it's a good idea anyway. It doesn't have to be the highest quality as far as I'm concerned. But yes, adding some you know, it's a little bit of circular logic to ask, is it good to add good compost? I'm like, yes, as long as it's good compost, I'd say even if it's not that great a compost, it's a good idea to add it to add it to a worm, but it's going to provide that bulky material. There's going to be some stuff in there that's not broken down. It's going to be, uh, I think, a, a pretty good bedding. What I will say is that compost, finished compost, is going to have a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's not going to have a ton of available carbon because it's been consumed by the microbes. So you want to add some more carbon rich material uh, to, to the compost, I think, to, to start a worm bin. Uh, Anton asked, and Troy, you actually answered almost all of it already, wondering if the worms consume mycorrhizal fungi. I believe they consume nematodes and do they consume, consume protozoa? I believe you answered that they do consume nematodes and protozoa, but how about the mycorrhizal fungi? Yeah, they're, as they're chewing through soil or at the top layer of soil, they're going to be eating, feeding on uh, different fungal hyphae. So either mycorrhizal fungi or saprophytic fungi, yeah. Okay. Um, cousin is asking on YouTube, what about adding bokashi to the bin prior, uh, bokashi to the kitchen bin prior to adding it to the worm bin? You know, bokashi is a, is a method of anaerobic composting. It's, it tends to be very acidic. That would tell me that you typically don't want to be adding that to a worm bin. However, I've heard people that swear by it. So I think if you are re-exposing that Bokashi to air and it's re-oxygenating itself, um, I, I know some people do it and love it. I've never done it. Um, sure, I don't know if you have any uh, any experience with that or, or an opinion, but I'd say, I'd say give it a shot. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah, I'm not a fan of Bokashi, but I'm not putting it down. Uh, it's hard to manage and maintain. I feel like for a lot of people, because it just gets anaerobic. It's normally, it's using anaerobic microorganisms, but it gets extremely anaerobic easily. But yeah, um, yeah if that's something that you wanted to mess with in just your small bin to kind of get that uh, in your kitchen to get that inoculated, then it'll help. Yeah. And then like Steve, Steve is correct. Anything that has gone anaerobic, once you expose it to air, you're going to have aerobic microorganisms that are starting to take that over uh, as you incorporate air. So Troy and I have been, take over. Troy and I've been working with a guy and I think we may have him on one of these. Uh, it's, it's a pretty dense topic, but he basically does 23 and me for compost to figure out exactly what species uh, these different uh, composts and vermicompost have in them. It shouldn't be any surprise that vermicompost has an incredible species diversity, incredible biodiversity. Uh, much more so than compost, you know, all things being equal. He did say that he has looked at Bokashi, he has sequenced the DNA in Bokashi and found that it was very non-diverse. It was mostly, I believe he said, lactobacillus. Um, yeah. And and so, you know, if you're at, trying to add some microbes, you're going to add some microbes. You may not be adding a ton of different microbes when you do when you add Bokashi to, to a worm bin. And, but I will say this not being an expert on Bokashi at all and, and the fact that anecdotal evidence suggests that the worms do seem to like it. Um, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Urban, worm beds, urban worm bag seems dry. What's the best way to add water without getting too moist? Uh, I think Troy kind of covered that. It's going to be frequent addition, frequent but small additions of water on a mist setting. Whatever your finest mist is that you can spray, give it 10 you know, give it 10 sprays, come back a couple hours later, give it 10 again. You just want to slowly allow the vermicompost to add to, to, to absorb that moisture so it doesn't run to the bottom, which is going to make your worms run to the bottom of your urban worm bag, which defeats the whole point of having an urban worm bag. Um, let's see here. Um, so David does have one of the, the, the holder of worm, worm goodies, he calls it uh, on the, uh, the tabletop uh, composter uh, thing and he's he's seeing mold in it. Um, is that beneficial or should he just put the moldy stuff in a hot compost pile? I think putting the moldy stuff in a worm bin is just fine. I will say if you got you know allergies or maybe issues, I don't know if these are the kind that can you know develop and sort of get get spread through the spores spread through your house or not. I have when I've overdone it with feeding in a worm bin and found mold, I have not had any issues. The worms catch up with it; they figure it out. 
Um, Troy, what, what do you have on that quickly? Yeah, generally, if you've got brown material mixed in with that, you're not going to – if you've got mold to begin with and then you mix it in with some brown stuff, generally the mold is going to dissipate or it'll just stay, you know, small. It's not going to be taking over the bin or anything like that. It's it's normally going to be strictly to, for that type of fruit or vegetable too, uh, specific to that fruit or vegetable. It's not like it's probably going to go on to the others and, you know, repopulate. Um, Alvin on YouTube asks, he kind of teased this up for me. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, is rinsed cocoa core as stated by the manufacturer and like you have on your website? Okay. So when, so uh, to parse that out a bit, he's basically saying is when, when it says rinsed cocoa core, is that, is that good for a worm bin? I would say, yes. Let me just explain the rinsed part of it. Like Troy was talking about is that coconut core is made from the husks of coconuts it's a waste product that's basically been turned into a soil amendment it's going to be on the coast mostly of india and bangladesh and indonesia it's going to be salty initially and it needs to have that salt rinsed out of it uh so um they measure the salt by the conductivity and there are different units of measure the one you're going to see the most common commonly is ds over ds over cm i believe it is and you're going to want to look for a number that is one to 1 1.5 or below if you get it two that's considered a high salt uh cocoa core i will honestly say i think the worms are not as sensitive to what are considered high salt coconut core because it's it, troy may disagree with me on this i think that the people who really care about salt uh in coconut core are going to be cannabis growers um for reasons that I, I actually don't know that much about exactly what it does, but uh, you you do want to find something if you can that is rinsed, and ours ours have been rinsed, um, and it's we've had we've had great feedback on it, Alvin. So thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, moisture zone. Let's see. Let me. I think we covered some of these already. Um, Someone had asked about adding worm shells, worm shell egg shells to the worm bin yeah. on a weekly basis. Uh, I think that's fine. It, uh, adding eggshells is going to help to add some calcium worms through their, because of the way they work in their digestive system, they add more calcium to the material anyway. So that's not necessarily necessary, but the eggshells are going to help to add grit, which um, the worms use in their gizzard to help to uh, consume and break down material. Okay. Uh, Alvin asks, in a new bin or bag where the initial bedding has been in place for a couple weeks, which is what I recommend, I recommend get your bedding ready and, and get inoculated with microbes with some organic food waste before you put the worms in. He's saying, is it okay to add, is it necessary to add bedding when you add your worms again or only with food? I would say if you're introducing your worms to your bedding that you've had going, you don't need to add more bedding when you put the worms in there. Only add, You only need to worry about adding the bedding when you're putting the food waste uh, in there. Uh, Greener Life is asking on YouTube thoughts about springtails in a in a worm bin. I think spring springtails are probably one of the most benign pests that are out there. There's not that much that they're going to do. They 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 are springtails are going to be very white, jumpy, uh, kind of fast moving uh, creatures. They're going to be fairly small, but you're still going to see them. Um, I would say I wouldn't worry too much about it uh, about springtails. Are really if you're going to have a problem in your worm bin, you want to have that problem, which isn't really a problem. They're just, they're also just good composters. Um, Randall asked something, Troy, and I, I wouldn't, I don't know this. How do you use nematodes? Cause I know you can buy nematodes online. What do people do with those? And, and what are, what is going to be the, the point of adding them either to a worm bin or to soil or whatever medium that you're, that you're talking about? Uh, most of the nematodes that you're going to purchase um, people are using for um, types of larva in their lawns. So like the um, uh, Japanese beetle that has that grub. And if you purchased uh, nematodes from it, they're actually bacterial feeding nematodes. But what they do is uh, lay eggs inside the larva. And then the, as the nematodes start to grow, they basically parasitize the uh, larva and will eat away and shrink the populations of uh, problematic things like usually they're 
not super specific, but it's for different, you know, like there'll be certain grubs or larvae that uh, you'll buy uh, certain nematodes for. But yeah, it's generally that type of deal. Cool. Uh, New Georgia Gardener asks, how often should you harvest castings from the urban worm bag? That is a, I have customers that will harvest once a week. I will have harvesters that will, or I will have customers that will harvest once every two months. I tend to harvest less frequently. Um, the ones that harvest every week, what they tend to do is they tend to start with a material like leaf mold and, and, and let, like really stuff that's broken down quickly. You can add a whole lot of that stuff in. You're not, it's not like adding food waste. Uh, the worms do like it. They do consume it. And by leaf mold, I mean leaves that have already started breaking down. They tend to be already rich in microbes. Uh, the people that harvest frequently tend to be starting with uh, material like that, that the worms will consume quickly uh, with things like food waste. I don't think that you want to harvest every week. Um, I, I just, I just don't think you're going to get that kind of performance out of, out of the bag. So I would say that when you do harvest um, only harvest to the point where you actually start when you harvest to, to the point where you start seeing undigested matter and a lot of worms in the bin. If you haven't, it, a couple things here. If you haven't managed the moisture correctly and you've got a lot of moisture in the bottom of your bin, you're you're going to have a lot of worms. I would just take that material and I would just put it right back in the top. I would not add water at that point because you've already just added something that's got a lot of water to it. Um, and then I would get your moisture under control. And after a while, the bin at the bottom is going to start to uh, is going to start to dry out a little bit. And one of the things you can do is take off the removable bottom, or if you have one of the old zipper versions, you can undo the zipper uh, with just the interior drawstring, the interior liner. And that's going to, that's going to air out the bottom of the bin. It's going to dry things out. And it's in a way going to push the worms up towards where the areas that are more, that are more moist. So this is a long answer to a very simple question, but I can't answer the simple question simply. So uh, harvest the castings, long story short, harvest the castings as often as you can without finding a whole lot of unprocessed material because then you've kind of gotten into the area where the worms never really got to. The only caveat there is that if you start with a, a your first couple harvests of an urban worm bag are going to be a lot of unprocessed bedding because we're starting with that initial sort of sacrificial layer or bedding layer uh, at at the bottom and then starting to add the food waste and the bedding on top of there. So your first harvests are not necessarily going to be worked by the worms. Um, Alvin, uh, or I'm sorry, Albert in Germany is asking is feeding eggshell once a week. Is that good? Well, I don't know. It, it depends on if your worm bin needs eggshell, which eggshells, which are calcium carbonate to help increase your pH. I doubt you need it. Eggshell is a good grit, which is a good additive for a, uh, for a worm bin, it helps the worms digest things. Um, but I, I rarely have added anything like that. And I don't think I'm suffering for it. So if you have them and want to add them in, I think it's fine. If not, if not, no big deal. So cool. Um, we have, uh, I think we're, let's see here, Troy, did you, I don't know if you were looking, but, um, uh, I think people are, what I want to thank you guys actually is that you're doing great at answering each other's questions. So there are things that we're answering that, that I, I think some of you have been uh, uh, actually helping each other out. So I want to thank you for that. Um, so is there anything, uh, is there anything anybody else has? I've got the, uh, I, I went through the stuff that we had kind of starred uh, to, to answer. Um, is there anything anybody else has before we wrap it up? Because we've been at it an hour now, and you guys are hanging on great. I know that some people come, some people go, but we've been hanging out at 80-some 80, 80 viewers for a while. Um, I was just, I, There was one question about uh, – I, I can make it real quick. Uh, Alvin asked about the potential for E. coli from worm tea. So this is one of the reasons that you wouldn't want to use leachate from a worm bin is that um, – so spinach is something that can easily get E. coli. If you were to put spinach in your worm bin that doesn't get broken down immediately, and it's got a little bit of E. coli that worms haven't gotten to, and you're putting water on the top, and then it flows down, and you're collecting this stuff, those food scraps that haven't been worked by worms and microorganisms could be uh, have some potential stuff that in there that could threaten plants or, or human health. Um, but like somebody answered your question, normally once worms have worked through a material, 
there's something about the slime on them that will kill E. coli. So microorganisms and worms working in tandem are going to uh, limit any pathogens in a material. So uh, it would be fine to use finished worm compost. You should be fine using that, but that's why leachate can be an issue when you're composting food scraps because of water passing through uh, stuff that could be have pathogens on there. Cool. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, posting the compost calculator. I'm just going to put that in the uh, comments here. Uh, Maggie asks a good question. Is, is overcrowding of worms an issue? No. <laughs> um, you don't want to typically start a bin with too many worms uh, just because they will, they could, they could flee, but worms will stop reproduction uh, when it seems like they are great at sensing when the conditions are not right for them to continue propagating. So they will stop, uh, they will stop reproduction and kind of stabilize, stabilize their growth. So um, yeah, uh, I think, I think that is probably a good place to stop it. So Troy is headed to Jamaica on Sunday and he's going to be there for two weeks, helping out the Jamaican government, Jamaican farmers with soil quality uh, it's going to be a lot of emphasis on vermicompost there. So we uh, want to wish Troy a, a, you know, bon voyage from here. Um, hopefully he'll be writing, writing uh, some, some good stuff about it when he gets back and, and his experience there. Troy, is there anything, uh, can you just give the 10 second, you know, 10 second, w w what you're doing, who you're working for? Um, yeah. On that? So it's uh, through USAID and the farmer to far farmer to farmer program. Uh, that's also part of Partners of America. And then the local group in Jamaica is escaping me right now. Uh, but those are the main ones from the United States to tie in with the Jamaica. And um, the main reason it's kind of cool uh, in a way is that the petroleum prices have caused skyrocketing uh, synthetic fertilizers this year. And so they're wanting to already move in a more sustainable direction. So, but the cost of fertilizers is really forcing them to move in a more sustainable direction as well. So I'm going down to teach uh, vermicomposting, soil biology, and ways of using like organic production and biological farming to help to replace uh, synthetic chemicals and conventional farming. So uh, I'll be taking lots of pictures and uh, have a write up too. So I'll be sharing that experience when I get back. Very cool. So next week I will be doing this uh, solo. Um, I'm almost positive I'll be doing it. I have to check my work schedule, make sure that I'll be in town. Uh, I've got a couple ideas of what to cover. Um, I'm really kind of interested uh, in covering maybe some business topics. Uh, it's it's one of the things I'm I'm fairly passionate about. I feel like Troy does a great job of covering the biology. I kind of like covering the business side of things for folks. That may be something you guys want to want to see. I, it may be something that has a very, like a bit of a smaller audience, but a much more enthusiastic audience. Cause I think that there are some, there's some ideas I have about starting a business in this industry um, that are probably not what you would expect. And it's, and it's on, you know, I base this on my own uh, experience uh, since 2014, when I've been exploring, you know, when I first started exploring the worm business as a business, um, so there are some things I would love to maybe talk about. So I may cover that. If not, uh, we will cover a bit more of a, like a worm binny kind of, uh, 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 kind of topic. So with that, I think we should, uh, should wrap it up and, uh, we'll bid, uh, Troy a fond farewell for a couple weeks and then he'll be back at the end of uh, September. And, uh, hopefully I will see you guys uh, next week for the next, uh, Wiggle Wednesday. All right. See you everyone. See everybody. Take care. Thank you.